still working on. Uh, one of the students um, a couple of years ago worked on this for, for the practicum. So I just wanted to give you an idea of the type of project sometimes we do, um, just kind of an introduction to some of the model work. So, uh, so today I'm gonna first, uh, I know you guys don't have a lot of machine learning background maybe, or even what is deep learning. So I'm gonna try to do in baby steps and then I'm gonna go and just tell you about some experiments, right? But in this part, if you, if you have any questions, just kind of let me know. Um, and then uh, basically what I'm gonna talk about today is how to design smaller neural networks for uh, data sets in medical physics or, or in medicine in general. Uh, and finally, I will talk to you about a particular collaboration we have with UCSF and, and this one of the projects that we're gonna be, you know, we're gonna try to do this year, okay? So, so what is machine learning? And hopefully you guys are gonna start a machine learning class pretty soon, right? Or you already started? Not yet, no? Um, so what is machine learning? So um, machine learning is the science of getting computers to learn and act like humans do and improve their learning over time in autonomous fashion by feeding them data and information in the form of observations and real world interactions. So basically we learn from experience, a computer learns from the data. And this is kind of one of the definitions of machine learning. Not all of them are exactly like that. Um, so what is uh, supervised machine learning? So in supervised machine learning, uh, we have a task uh, and, and basically the idea is that we have X and X is your data and Y, Y is your label, okay? And what you wanna do is that you wanna map the input, which is this X to the output, which is Y, okay? So you want to have a function that is gonna map, map X to Y, right? For example, you guys are talking about regression right now, right? So in regression, what you have is that X is your, you know, X1, X2, X3, X4, right? And Y may be, you know, maybe the price of a house, right? So maybe you have like the number of bathrooms, number of bedrooms, blah, 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 anything you wanna know about a house, and then you have the price, you know, maybe the location, right? And then you have a price. So you wanna have a function, in this case, a linear function that is gonna map you know, all the features that you have on the house to the price of the house, right? So, so that's uh, supervised machine learning. So, so let's actually play a little game here in which, um, for example, if we have an image classification problem, so you have an image and you wanna know if the, the image has a dog or a cat. So what is X? It's the image. X is the image and Y? Well, Y is maybe zero one, it's the label, it's either a cat or a dog, right? So what about a spam detection on emails where maybe you have an email and that may be your X, the text of the email maybe, and the Y is whether it's spam or not, right? Um, we'll, we'll talk about the house estimation already. So you have some features about a house and then you have the price of the house. So the features are X, the price is Y, right? So what about if you have, uh, you want to translate a sentence from Spanish to French. So I'm just gonna tell you. So the input is a sentence, say X is a sentence in Spanish and Y is a sentence in French, right? So that's the input on the output. Um, if you had to find a tumor in an image, well, the input is maybe, a, you know, some kind of MRI or a scan or something which is three dimensional. And the output may be the same image, but maybe a mask of the tumor, for example. That may be one way to do it. Another way to do it is whether there is a tumor or not, and that would be just kind of one number, right? Okay, so you get an idea, right? So we do all of these things in this program. Um, so, um, so you say, so the goal of a supervised machine learning problem is to find a function f, right? This function could be linear in the case of linear regression, right? And what you wanna do is to approximate label y, right? And what means approximate is a big 
it's something that we have to talk about in more detail. You want to minimize always like something people call loss function, right? But let's not worry about it too much. So what we want to do is just we want to find a function f that approximates y, right? So f is what we call a model. Okay, so f is what we call a model. So so basically the goal of supervised function learning is to you know basically we usually have f has a particular form, right? It's, it maybe it could be a tree or it could be a linear function or it could be a neural network. And then we usually fit the parameters of that function. Okay, so, so that's, uh, you know, that's kind of the goal here, right? And then basically what is deep learning? It's very simple. F is a neural network. That's it, that, that's, the, that's the definition of deep learning. So more or less is when the function, the model that you are trying to optimize is a neural network. The term deep learning comes just from the fact that um, recently very deep neural, uh, neural networks have been very successful at solving a bunch of different problems. So that's why uh, the term neural network was kind of um, translated into like a deep learning right now. Some people talk about deep learning instead of like neural network learning. It's just a brand. It's not it's nothing, nothing that deep, let's say. Okay, so any questions? You guys are good? Yeah, let me know. So why why do we wanna why do we wanna do deep learning? Um, so this is kind of an interesting question. Um, so a few years ago, like you know 2012 or whatever, people were not the term deep learning didn't exist, and people were not that worried about you know feeding a bunch of neural networks. So what happened is that um, because our computing is getting better, our data is getting bigger, and because of a few um, new results on neural network, what happened is that we uh, have been able to train models that are doing much better on certain problems than any of these other models we had before. And what do I mean by better? So if you have, say, um, a linear model or a random forest or any other method that is not, say, a neural network, and you increase the amount of data, at some point, those methods are going to plateau, basically. They are not going to like keep going. But if you have like a lot of data and you have kind of deeper and bigger models, you see that you keep improving performance basically over time. So that's basically why uh, eventually for certain type of data, you want to use neural network instead of, um, instead of other models, more traditional models. Do you have a question? Yeah. So is it always the case that uh, the trend holds true or? Hmm? Sorry. Is it always the case that the trend shown holds true or in general this holds true? Say again. Is it always true that uh, small neural networks will beat the traditional learning algorithms, or in general they beat with the amount of data increasing? Yeah. So actually, I'll tell you about this later. So basically, if you have, you know, if your data is not that small, if you have just a couple of classes, you don't need them. You know, big neural networks, right? But you're gonna see that for certain data sets that are pretty big and have a lot of classes. The minute that you improve the networks and make them kind of bigger and more powerful, you get better performance. And I'm going to show you some examples of that uh, today. But on the other hand, actually, people have been worrying too much about these kind of huge networks. And when your data is not that complicated, which is what I'm going to show you before, you know, today, you don't need those big networks. And maybe you actually want to have tiny networks that work well, you know? So there is kind of both ways. Like if you have a very complicated problem, you know, like self-driving cars or whatever, maybe actually go ahead and, and and kind of use a huge network. But if your problem has a couple of classes, you know, you're gonna do fine with small network, you know? So that's kind of the talk is about that, <laughs> more or less. Yeah, if you guys have any questions, just grab a mic. So when do you use deep learning? So you guys, we're gonna talk more about this later, right? But in general, you, you want to use deep learning for images, for video, for text, 
for these data sets that are um, non-tabular, basically. There are some tabular data sets in which deep learning is going to work well as well. And I'm going to tell you about some of those as well. But um, there are other algorithms like gradient boosting, random forest, which are very, very good at dealing with tabular data, pretty much because they're very good at um, selecting good variables. And neural networks right now, uh, so far, are not that good at selecting variables. So, so anyway, so the kind of rule of thumb sometimes is that if you have a tabular data, you want to use gradient boosting. But if you have you know, text, images, and things like that, you, you actually want to go to neural networks. Okay. That's kind of in general, right? I'm going to actually show you today an example of kind of tabular data in which you actually want to use deep learning. So if you are doing recommendation systems, like a lot of this uh, type of data actually uses, um, because there is a deep learning trick that works really well there, uh, then uh, at that point, you actually want to use neural networks for that. Okay, so let me actually tell you about some some of the um, you know some of the uh, some examples. I don't, I don't have too many of them right now because uh, I usually go through a lot of them in class. So so I have some of them from from medicine, right? And this is a paper in which they talk about classification of skin cancer uh, with neural networks, and they um, they basically show that they can do it as good as uh, dermatologists, like trained dermatologists. So that's kind of one uh, just kind of cool paper. Um, then uh, they also have like basically Google had some, um, some methods in which you can predict mortality from um, medical records. Also uh, kind of um, with very good results. So this is an FDA approved breast cancer detection system, also based on, on neural networks. Detection of lung cancer uh, from low dose CT scans. And so as I told you before, um, the YouTube recommendation system is also a neural network based uh, system. And we will talk about this in my class in, in, in more detail. Um, so, so let me tell you, so these are some examples, and let me now tell you a little bit more about some of the data sets that we, we have out there. So the most kind of in the, in the image data sets, the data set that is kind of more famous is called uh, ImageNet. There are different subset of ImageNet. Uh, there is one that is just a task, that is classification task. There are actually different tasks. There is like detection and there are a few other tasks out there. In general, they have 14 million images, but when they talk about the classification task, a lot of the time what they talk about is 1.2 million images that they have. Uh, this task has a thousand uh, classes. Here are some examples on what the classes look like. So it could be like a ship, a scooter, a leopard, a mite, mushroom, cherry, and so on. So, so they are very diverse data sets. Actually, one of the things about the data set that is very interesting is that sometimes you will have like something very far away from uh, another object, but they also have, say, the type of dogs, right? So things that are in principle are very hard to differentiate, even by humans. So they have these classes that are very different, like a mushroom and a mite, but they also have like basically the type of dog, right? That's more, much more difficult to differentiate. So it's a pretty complex uh, data set and all image models are tested on ImageNet, are trained for ImageNet. So a lot of what people do is say, hey, I have this like new architecture, with this million of parameters, and I train it, you know, for I don't know how many days on ImageNet, you know? So that's basically what people talk about uh, a lot. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about a history of what happened with ImageNet, in particular with the ImageNet uh, challenge. So uh, the ImageNet challenge ran from like 2010 to 2017. 
On 2017, they proved that the models were better than humans, so they stopped the challenge. We still have a lot of papers saying, hey, I do better on ImageNet, right? So, but the challenge itself stopped on, on 2017. So what happened here, I don't know if you guys see that, um, so this, um, so first of all, what you see is that the error, uh, uh, top five error classification, don't worry about what top five means right now, but you see that the error decreases with time, right? So on the right, you have 2010, on the left, you have, um, a, you have um, a 2015, and the error just kind of went down crazy, right? Um, another thing that you see is that the number of layers went up, right? So first it was kind of shallow, very shallow, and then, you know, eight layers, and then 19 layers, and then 22 layers, and then on 2015, 152 layers, right? So that's kind of crazy. So one thing that happened in all these years is that people had to come up with better tricks to train these networks, because a long time ago, meaning 2012, we didn't know how to train on 152 layers. So a lot of what happened in all these years is that people have been getting better and better architectures that train on, on, on a lot of layers and a lot of data and so on. So on 2012 was the first year that actually a deep learning model won the competition. And actually the, the error also went down dramatically because if you see the error from 20, 10 to 2011 just went down by a little bit. But then from 2011 to 2012, went down by a lot, right? So that's basically when people talk about the deep learning revolution starting was kind of around that time, when people started to see that this was working for real on a lot of data and a lot of classes, right? So um, yeah, so let me tell you, so this is, um, this is basically, I took this snapshot from, this website that looks at all the papers that test on ImageNet. So what you're seeing here is top one, this is accuracy, basically. So you have a thousand classes, right? So in 2011, the accuracy was 50%, but this is 50% of a thousand classes. So this is not that bad, you know, 50% is not bad, right? If you're talking about just the top, you're just comparing the top probability you're getting from your model to the actual probability, it may be that the top probability is like a type of dog and the second one is another type of dog, you know? So it basically 50% um, is not bad, right? So, and nowadays, so you see that a bunch of years have passed and people keep um, coming up with new models and new models. And, and then basically right now we are at kind of a 90%, which is kind of incredible, right? So, so basically, this is um, this is how ImageNet accuracy have uh, increased over time, and this is the number of parameters. And you know, these are millions. You know, like uh, I mean, uh, yeah, this is totally kind of crazy. Maybe I, I think AlexNet, which was back then, I forget exactly, it's like sixty million. I forget exactly how much it has. Um, but basically, right now we are at this kind of crazy number. You know, the, the some of the networks in the middle are actually smaller than the initial networks, but then they have been going, you know, up and down, you know, up. Professor, yeah. Uh, so the data is two million uh, rows, right? Uh, the the data is uh, one point two million uh, images. So. Yeah. So. So we are uh, using 14, uh, 147,000 uh, 147, uh, uh, parameters, right? So aren't we overfitting that completely? Yeah, this is a com complex question. Uh, most likely we are overfitting and the overfitting doesn't work. Uh, it's, it's actually in these deep learning models, we have learned that overfitting is not really completely bad. We actually, most of the times we overfit. But the other thing you have to think about is that an image is not just one number. The image has a lot of pixels. And then if I um, rotate the image, which I often will do, or I will like crop the image in different places, I will create new images with the same label. So it's not really like, if you talk about a data point in an image, it's more than just kind of one data point in some ways, right? So you can learn a 
start from one data point, especially if you rotate it and then crop it in different ways, maybe deform it even a little bit. Um, so, so that becomes kind of another point, let's say. So but that's a good question. It's always a problem. And, and actually, even that model um, is a new model. I actually haven't read the paper yet. I am uh, planning to learn it. It is possible that they are using some new techniques to actually train on even more data. So most likely, they are training on a lot more data than 1.2 million images right there. So they are using probably something called unsupervised training, in which you use images without labels to pre-train a model. And it's an idea that I'm happy to talk to you more about. So, so probably that model right there uh, is training a lot of more data and clever tricks uh, with that. Um, yeah, good, okay. So, so what is a newer network? You know, because in a way, I don't want you guys to be thinking that this is actually something that is Say too complicated. The, the best way I have to describe a neural network is that if you guys understand what a linear model is, you are basically doing, in this case, so I have like four features. My four features are latitude, longitude, bedrooms, and baths. Okay. And this, you know, each of these like orange circles is kind of a linear model plus a nonlinear function on top of that. It will be each one of these circles can be interpreted as a logistic regression model. So some kind of probability on the initial features. So the way that you think about those is that engineer features. They depend on the input features. They are functions of the input feature, right? So you are now computing four of these features. Again, these are, think about it, you have a linear model and then you put a nonlinearity after that and that will give you another feature, right? Say, for example, that you have longitude and latitude, and you make a feature that is something like neighborhood. I don't know if you think about it that way. That we'll do a combination of those, and then we will do something else, and then we'll that will be some some kind of neighborhood or something like that. Um, okay, and then so you have all of these kind of engineer feature. Okay, and from that engineer feature, you do another linear model to predict price. Does it make sense? So from the green original features, you make new features that are the orange features. From the orange features, in this case, you do a linear model to predict price. Yeah. Would it be like a, uh, I don't wanna say a one-on-one -on -one map, that's not what I mean, but like four, Four original features, four engineered features, or can it be bigger? Oh, it's a lot bigger usually. Yeah, this is a very small example, but you know, you have as many input features as you want, and then you have as many, you know, engineer features in the middle as you want, and then the number of uh, final features depend on your problem. So if you have a regression problem like price, you just need one number, right? But if you have a thousand. A categories, you need a thousand probabilities, so you will have a thousand dots at the end. Okay. Yeah. How do you go about deciding your layers? Because couldn't you potentially add another layer to this and another totally, layer? Totally, totally, an totally. You guys there? are having great questions. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. And that's part of basically what would be the design, the architecture design, right? And we will talk about that a lot because um, that's actually pretty important, but it's not really clear what, what's the best way to do it, right? You know, it's uh, what you do is that you follow what all people do. So you go and study the literature and more or less follow what all people do. Especially when we come to deal with images, you never want to do your own architecture. You want to see what people are doing out there and use the, the architecture that people are providing. Right? This is a very simple fit forward neural network. Here you can decide maybe I want a couple of, in general, you say when I want one hidden layer, this is the, the orange layer is kind of like a hidden layer. Maybe you want one or two hidden layers, and probably that's it. You don't want, you don't may not need such a deep network if you are trying to predict price of a house. In the case of images, you do seem to want kind of deeper networks. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So um, so the best, you know, finally the research question that we had 
was that do we need the same type of networks for medical data sets? So what is the difference between ImageNet and your usual data set that, that you may have in medicine or even in some other applications? Well, the difference is that ImageNet has a thousand classes. To be able to differentiate this dog from this other type of dog, you need a lot of very sophisticated features, right? Now, if I have two classes, one with a tumor, another one without a tumor, that's much simpler, right? So maybe I don't need this like kind of huge architectures, right? So a, a typical medical data set may be like, you know, maybe 10 classes, maybe two classes, right? Um, maybe a thousand images, maybe hundreds of images, right? So you, you don't have the same amount of data there. But also more than anything, you don't have the same amount of classes either. So if you think about a linear model, we'll take a line and divide and say, these are the positives and these are the negatives. You know, it's much simpler to do, to divide a space for two classes than if you have a thousand classes in which you need a lot of more, you know, features and, and things like that, right? So basically that was the question that we have. And that's kind of what we, the experiments we did were to understand that. Um, so, so basically the, the idea is the following. Suppose you have a model kind of on the left, which is very fatty, you know, like deep and fat, you know. So can we actually find like a model on the right, maybe skinnier or maybe even shorter and get the same results? So that was kind of the, the question. And we know that in ImageNet that doesn't happen, right? Like in a way, if you guys remember, there is this, this top one accuracy has been changing for a long time. So in ImageNet, we seem to want to not only have the right architecture, the type of training is super important, how you train those architectures. It's actually sometimes pretty hard to train them well. People have to tell you their recipe for training for you to be able to train them in the right way. So if you have a thousand classes and a lot of images, it's pretty complicated to, to train and so on, right? So to get kind of good results and also to, to be able to, to train those models is kind of tricky, right? So here we are talking about much you know, smaller and simple data sets. So, um, so now why is scaling down models, you know? So, the obvious thing is that you train them faster. You may be able to put them in a small device. So think about um, in the future, um, people in an emergency vehicle will have some of small device, will do something, will run a model, and will tell you what's going on with this person, right? So, um, or even we are carrying devices like our, our phones that are doing right now things like understanding how well you're sleeping, right? or many other things. So these things that are happening like right now, also in the future is part of this, but so you may think that maybe you want models that are smaller than the ones we're talking about. And because we keep talking about ImageNet as this like the goal that everybody wants to break, then maybe we are not thinking that much about the smaller data sets that uh, are also important, right? Especially either you know, medical and so on, so maybe important. So, so basically what you want is to reduce the number of operations and memory while keeping the same you know, or similar performance. So, so let me tell you about some of the data sets that we look at. So this one is, um, we have this X-ray images and the idea was to figure out if the image was like normal or abnormal. If, so this is another data set in which we had um, pneumonia detection. So basically either there is pneumonia or there is a pneumonia. And this does it, we also have when we have the pneumonia, we also have a bonding box that tells you where the main kind of problem is. So that's another thing about the data set. Um, so finally we have this data set that uh, is also an X-ray and they have like 14 labels. The way to think about these 14 labels is that each one of these labels is a binary problem. So the person either have edema or not, either have like, you know, I don't know how to do those names very well. So a fusion or not, and so on, right? So you have 14 labels for each image. 
and you want to solve all of them at the same time. Okay, so these are more or less the sets that we have. And these data sets are not that bad in the sense that in some cases we have good like thousands of images, right? Some of them in reality are smaller than the ones we are talking about here. Uh, these are actually not that bad in terms of the amount of data. So, so, but then, so let me tell you a little bit about the results and then tell you more or less what we did. So there is, uh, there is a very, there are very famous models called ResNet. And from all those models, ResNet 18 is the smallest one. More or less the ones that are kind of famous, right? So the first thing we do is say, well, can we start downgrading ResNet and see what happens? So the, the line that you see there, the kind of purple line, is when we um, kind of um, cut down different calculated how parameters on ResNet. And you can see that pretty much looks a little bit kind of uh, flat. What is kind of even more interesting is that then we take mobile net, which is another type of network that is designed to be small and run the same experiment. And we see that uh, we can go down by a lot uh, on, on ResNet as well and keep kind of Maybe at the end, you don't see, you see it going down a little bit, but for a while, it actually has very good results, right? So let me actually show you, um, you know, I just basically took the first part of the, of, of the first plot and plot it separately, so you guys have more of an idea of what's going on at the end. Um, and the, the other experiment, that is the green experiment is, is mobile net, and the red one here is um, an experiment, a different experiment with ResNet. Uh, that also seems to be kind of very, very kind of giving good results as well. So let me. Uh, so this is basically. Sorry about this. This is. Um, um, so this is also this is another data set, and we see kind of similar results. I can tell you more about this. Uh, you see, the gray lines is that I did three experiments, and I, I run three experiments, and then the the main line that you see is the mean of the experiments. And the gray lines are like the minimum and the maximum. So in some cases, you don't see the gray line at all because they are also all very similar. All the numbers are very similar. In some cases, you see a bit more noise and that's why you see the, the gray lines kind of the, it's not a confidence interval because it's actually just three points. But so these experiments are kind of expensive. So I cannot run them a hundred times to give you Stats. So I run it three times to give you some, some idea of the variation. So, so and this is finally another data set, and you know, kind of the same story. Maybe at the end you see a small decrease in performance with this kind of small architecture. But you see, we are going from like ResNet had like one eleven point two million parameters to like zero point sixteen million parameters. So it's like a pretty good reduction uh, in terms of the number of parameters. So, so what are these experiments, you know? So like when we did the ResNet and, you know, I don't want to go much, too much into that image here, but I'm just going to tell you a little bit. So this image is the first one is ResNet 18. And it's basically a bunch of layers. It's a like convolutional neural network. So it's like convolutional layers and the, the, each layer has some kind of width, like how fat it is that layer, right? And one thing that we can do is to cut the fatness of each layer. Another thing that we can do is to cut the, the whole network and put like less layers. So the middle one, uh, you have to read the numbers to figure out it's the same one as the first one, but less fat in each layer, less parameters per layer, but the same deepness, right? The next one is the same, fatness, but shorter, right? So when we run this with different parameters, so different ways to shorten the network and different ways to make, make it skinnier in a way. Okay, so that's kind of what we run. And I, I show you all of them in the same plot because what I'm, what I'm doing is the number of parameters by the uh, area under the curve is some metric the bigger the number, the better. Sorry, I didn't tell you that before. But basically, I'm plotting here the number of parameters by a metric that I want to be as high as possible. Okay. So and um, oh, sorry. 
So basically, uh, so we did that. We also tried some special type of convolutional network, uh, convolutional layer that is, um, is a bit different than the regular convolutional layer and has a lot less parameters. So we tried something called depth-wise convolution. And then with mobile net, we just increase the, the width and the depth as well. Um, so, so basically, this is how things look like per width. So basically, the black one is, uh, so if you look at this plot, uh, the black one is with the whole width. But then when you decrease the number of parameters, what you see is the, um, what you see is basically, when, when we are making it shorter, basically, it's less deep. As you look at some parameter, you're making it less deep. And uh, uh, so I have different colors for different width, you know? One thing that is very clear from here is that, um, is that basically reducing the width is more efficient at reducing the size of the network itself, right? And also, if you look at it here, you realize that maybe the smaller width, maybe it's a little bit too much, you start kind of losing performance, but maybe the width at uh, 0 0.5 actually is pretty good. I don't know if you, if you agree with me there, but um, it's a two different uh, data sets. And the third data set kind of look kind of similar to this. Oh, okay. So so these are the um, the people uh, that collaborated in, in here. So Roja Imani was a student here at MSDS. Andrew Sean was a staff researcher that used to work with us here. And Hilbert Mates is a professor at, at UCSF. And we are, um, you know, writing the paper as we speak, because uh, sometimes when you guys leave, uh, not everything is ready for publication. So that's, uh, that's, how, that's how, how things work. Um, so, so basically, in conclusion, what we were able to do is that we were able to substantially scale down models with almost no loss in performance for these medical data sets that are kind of simpler. Um, we realized that the decreasing um, uh, depth kind of is the kind of the best way to reduce fast, to fast reduce kind of the size of the network. And we realized that depth wide convolution layers are much more efficient than regular layers. So um, with this, I, I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the some of the work that we have been doing uh, with uh, in collaboration with Hilmer Valdez at UCSF, and basically one of the new practicum projects that we have for this year. So you have a question right there? Yeah, sure. Just want to know what's the I'm not sure that like, you're saying that you're reducing the number of years, but how do you suggest and what to cut down on? Yeah, yeah. So so basically the main the main idea is to try to reduce the size of the network, right? Like or at least one of the ways in which we reduce like computation is for reducing the parameters that you have on the models. And, and what happens is that usually we have some type of architecture that somebody came up with and people think it's very good, right? So we start with those architectures and we try to kind of scale down in different ways. To tell you the details on how we scale down, in some way I have to explain what is a convolution in one network. And it will take me a little bit of time. I think that we have to leave it for another day. But, uh, but in a way, I just wanted to give you an idea, you know, on how things kind of work. So in some ways, like when you look at the depth, it's like how many, Layers you have, you know, and when you, you look at the what width is how fat each one of those layers is. Maybe actually, like, maybe let me actually show you on this um, small, simpler, um, kind of simpler. Um, so think about it this way: I have two ways of decreasing the number of, uh, you know, kind of dots that I have in there. One way is to make it skinnier. Another way is to make it less deep, right? So those are kind of some trade-offs. There is a third way, actually, uh, that has to do with the computation of the convolutional layer itself, which is that there are different types of convolutional layers. 
and some of them are skinnier than other in some way. So that's kind of the, I don't know if that answered your question a little bit. Yeah, but is that like a preference on uh, which day you want to reduce the skin, like the skin of first and then reduce the layers or? We are trying to investigate that. Okay. So it's part of the investigation that we have. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. So, so basically, I wanted to tell you that um, so we are we have a new um, so we have this collaboration in which we are always interested in this idea of like maybe medical data sets. They may be in general, these are ideas that are not particularly about medical data sets. They could be talk about some more data sets as well. It's just that in the medical data set, we have some data and we know what it implies to like uh, the medical community. So, but these are actually very general ideas. So not really ideas that people just care about in the medical domain. So, and, and so the, the, what we have for this year is that, oh, sorry. Wait, what we have for this year is that um, recently uh, we had a paper in which um, we look at this algorithm called the lockdown algorithm. And the idea is to dream new and uh, so instead of dreaming the way I told you before like that, you dream uh, in a less um, kind of in a you make a network more sparse. Uh, so it's a bit different to what we have been doing this way. I don't know exactly how to explain it to you, but think about a network, a fully connected network. Imagine that you start deleting some of the edges something like that, right? So you make it a lot more sparse, okay? So you trim it down a lot. So the idea is um, that we trim it down. And this is very important, for example, if you have a tower data set and you have, for example, there was, there was a, a data set that we have that has like a thousand um, different genes, but then the number of people, observations that you have is 200. So you cannot really train a model on that because you have too many uh, features for the amount of observations you have. So the way you do that is by penalizing some of the connections. So you are trying to trim away some of the features that they're not gonna be important for your problem. So we um, you know, with this algorithm and then we apply it to some tower data set in particular, that sets like the one I just told you about that, that too wide. So you really need to trim a lot of these features down. And now what we wanna do is that we wanna apply this to more like larger neural networks uh, for images. So we would like to understand it, how well this will work. If either, if any of you have worked about LASSO or LASSO path. So this, this, uh, this algorithm is like a LASSO path for neural networks. So you can have an arbitrary number of penalizations. So yeah, so basically that's kind of one of the ideas we have. We also have some other ideas, but this is kind of one of the ideas. And you know, thank you. I just wanted to mention that if you can vote in California, remember that there is a recall election going on. Seems, seems pretty important. So I just voted. Uh, thank you. Yes. And uh, so, any questions that you have? Like, um, you have kind of uh, and there is another, another microphone right here. So, uh, what you were just discussing in the algorithm to trim down your uh, neural network is that a very similar idea? What we, what we were recently discussing in our linear regression course is uh, essentially seeing whether the X has a significant impact in Y. Is that kind of what that algorithm um, is I don't kind of hear you very well, but um, can you like go up, uh, is it on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I was just asking if the algorithm you were just talking about is really just kind of a more advanced version of checking to see if X is a significant impactor on Y, and if not, then it's, same, it's more sophisticated. Yeah, okay. it's more sophisticated because you're not checking one by one. What you're doing is a more an optimization way. You, what you are doing basically is that you are penalizing all the weights and you are, especially if you do something called L1 penalization, what happens is that you get rid of the weight altogether, but you are, you are using an optimization procedure on the whole problem. So instead of looking at one variable at a time, you are looking at all the variables. Okay. 
So Terence is going to talk about that in, in his class, uh, about how to do that in the context of linear regression for a fixed generalization parameter. So there is an algorithm that would do it for any, it's basically you want to pick your strength, how much you want to penalize, right? But there is an algorithm will do all of the penalization at the same time. So this is called a lasso path. And uh, this algorithm is a generalization of the lasso path for all the networks. For people on your networks, yeah. But it can be applied for anyone else as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, yeah, there is, um, okay, yeah. How is that lockout different from the dropout that usually happens in relation? Uh, it's very different because um, this uh, uh, lockout will completely drop some, uh, you basically some weights from your network. The dropout is a training technique in a way. So at the end, you will have a full network, right? In this case, um, so the dropout is a regularization technique, uh, but at the end of the day, you're going to have the full network here. At the end, you're going to have a network that may be like just like 10% of the original network. So you will start with the full network and you start penalizing, penalizing, and you keep it down to the minimum uh, possible looking at the regular, the, looking at your um, generalization potential, right? So you end up with a much smaller model at the end. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. All right, question again. Hello. Uh, so this terms of uh, neural networks, deep learning, machine learning. I'm just um, wondering if like there's some real learning or um, or is it just core engineering? Like is it similar to how we learn or is there some type of intelligence behind this model? Ah, models? okay, intelligence. You know, intelligence is a big word, right? <laughs> it's, uh, it's in some ways it depends what you call intelligence, right? And um, I don't think this is intelligence. It, this is like pattern matching, but it could be very useful even if we don't call it intelligence, right? So if you're able to see everything your phone does has a model behind and because of that is smarter, right? You know, maybe it's not intelligence, but something pretty helpful, right? If I uh, if Gmail writes your emails kind of because you start the email and you you can just like um, go on it will finish the phrase for you is that intelligence uh, it's pretty useful we don't I don't care that much it's intelligence it's kind of uh, useful so I think we get very small progress you know um, um, every year but I think it's useful uh, automating tasks that humans don't want to do and makes our life a little bit more efficient. I don't know if that's a question that you have. Uh, yes, so there is no way to like achieving general intelligence with this models, right? Um, I don't think so yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, anybody oh, over there? You have a question. You have to get your mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I was just gonna ask. Um, so what the goal of like scaling down these models is that more to just like reduce the the power it takes to do the computations, or is it more to like make it more applicable in general, or kind of like what's the yeah? In now? some cases, you want to reduce it just because um, you don't have enough data to learn. So to learn basically um, with a big model. Basically, in the case I was just telling you before, um, we have this in biology a lot—a bunch of genes, a lot of them, but then a lot of them are not very useful. And you have a lot of genes, but then you don't have that many people. So it's difficult to learn uh, with that many variables, right? Without trying to penalize uh, and select what is important and what's not important. So that's partially with that. The other one is that I have been just telling you how these models have been going bigger and bigger and bigger. And the question is, do we need that or not, right? So a lot of people have been, even in the search of like compact architectures, right? For many different reasons, for mobile, for, um, just for the fact that, um, uh, you know, some of these models take like days and days to train. So people even talk about like how many trees are we, you know, how much uh, pollution are we doing just by training these models, right? So it's, I think, a research question just in general that is a very good one, like how big these models need, uh, need to be actually, right? So that's kind of- and, uh, There's some questions in the chat line if you want to uh, click on that. Um, um, 
Thank you. Um, oh, the SWIFT uh, 0.25 means reduce the number of neurons uh, per layer by 75%. Um, it's not exactly like the math, it's not exactly like that, because his, his convolutional layers are kind of tricky. I wouldn't even be able to do the math in my head right now, so I would have to like actually uh, do the math for you some more time. That's the kind of one question. Hey, Arthur. Um, yeah, I think that people have a little bit of questions about uh, about with um, uh, people like to use variational optimization in general in many different ways, and it's not clear if it's better or not. So I have some other. Um, okay, somebody was talking about. Um, um, Transfer learning. I didn't talk about transfer learning, even if we did some experiment with transfer learning. I'll tell you very briefly what it is. Transfer learning is when you take um, like ImageNet, right? And you have your network, you first redraw your network on ImageNet, and then you fine tune your network on your particular task. And I'll tell you some more time what that means more in more details, but basically it is very useful because. So we did that actually. It's just that I didn't have enough time, and I have really I'm talking about a lot of things that you guys don't understand that well. So I didn't I didn't talk about that. But basically, uh, we did that. So we took some of the networks, we pre-trained them on ImageNet, and then we kind of called fine tuning on these particular uh, data sets, and they did a little bit better than the the ones trained from scratch. Um, let me tell you a little bit how that works. Just a second. So. Transfer learning is something very useful because, so you have ImageNet. What is this network kind of learning? In, in a way where you're learning intermediately, it's like, you know, oh, there is like white dots, you know, or, oh, you know, there is some kind of, um, you're learning kind of little features, you know, like how much color of this color it is, or, you know, what is the variation on blah, blah, blah. So you're trying to, like learn some kind of pattern matchings, you know, you know, maybe how many little lines like that you have or lines like these. So you're trying to learn all of these combinations of things. So if you do that a lot of natural images, maybe you can apply those things you have learned in a way, the way to think about this, you have learned a lot of features. And because you have you have done any data set that is so rich as ImageNet, you hope that those features are gonna to apply to your data, and they often do. So this idea of pre-training on, it's like basically taking this um, image net, learning a lot of features, very sophisticated features, and then going and using some of them in your own problem. And, and that is very good because sometimes you don't have enough data to find just to learn those features in your problem because you have, 500 images, right? So the 1.2 million images may be actually pretty useful at, at keeping, at, at learning those um, features that you may be able to just use like that, right? So that's kind of how it works. So people do that on images, they also do it in text. So think about taking the whole web or Wikipedia or all the books ever written or whatever and train them in order to learn English or learn any language, right? And then using whatever features that model learn from, from that learning, let's say, I can tell you more about what that means. And then after the model have learned English, then you ask the model, can you learn my other task? Whether this uh, review is positive or negative. And pretty sure the models are gonna be very good at the second task after they learn English. For sure, they're gonna be much better than train on the task just in general, right? Okay, guys, I think I, okay, unless there is a uh, last question. Yeah, do you, do you have a mic with you? Hello. Yeah. So I understand using transfer learning, we can reduce the size of our networks. 
but can we decrease the width also? Yeah, you can reduce. Um, um, you can reduce any any part. I mean, it's just the question is, what's the best way to reduce it, right? But you can reduce any any, any parameter of the network. But if we reduce the parameters, the original model changes, right? Totally, totally, totally. You can say, hey, I have a new architecture that I just reduced. I'm gonna train on that architecture, and then train on my task. Does it make sense? Standard techniques to reduce the width. Um, that's what we were talking about before. That you know, to, to explain you actually how to do it, I would have to tell you about convolutional neural networks, and it takes a couple of classes, you know, to explain that. So that's why I, I just kind of want you know hand wave the whole process, right? Thank you. Um, so by the way, guys, I teach a class at night. Um, in October, it's a seminar, especially for people that want to uh, do deep learning in their practicum. So I'll let you know about that. Um, okay, so maybe we stop here. And if you have any other questions, you can to talk to me. Okay. Thank you, guys. Uh, really Thank you.